This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during November. And this month, it's a four-course celestial meal. First, we'll seek out some shooting stars, then spot some bright planets, follow some celestial fish, and track down the Andromeda galaxy. Are you ready? Then grab your curiosity and come along on this month's Sky Tour. November is the month when we adjust our clocks to fall back an hour to standard time. That takes place before dawn on November 5th in the U.S. and Canada. But it's a week after our friends in Europe do so, and down under, our Australian friends move to summertime in early October. Mexico and tropical countries don't make the change at all, nor does China or Russia. Anyway, the return to standard time means that most of us are still heading home from work as evening's twilight sets in. That's just fine with me, thank you very much, because it means I can sneak in a little stargazing before dinner time. Full moon came and went on October 28th, and new moon falls on November 13th. So that means the two middle weeks of this month will be free of moonlight in the evening. Now, I love watching the moon, but its strong light makes it a challenge to appreciate the starry sky overhead. So, with the moon absent from evening skies starting in early November, keep an eye out for shooting stars from a meteor shower known as the Torrids. These are bits of debris shed by a periodic comet named Enki, and they appear to streak across the sky starting from a point in the constellation Taurus, which rises in the east not long after evening twilight. You might see torrid meteors any time from mid-October to late November. Usually they're few and far between, at most a few per hour from dusk to dawn. But many of them can create spectacular fireballs, the brightness and relative slowness of many torrid meteors make them ideal targets for photography or for getting some practice with judging exactly which constellations they cross. Lots of observers around the world actually record what they see during meteor showers, details that are very useful for meteor researchers. You might catch a second meteor shower, the Leonids, when it peaks late on the night of November 17th. Watch from a dark location, free of light pollution, and you might see a Leonid flash by every five or ten minutes. Two bright planets continue to grace the evening sky. Not long after sunset, look for brilliant Jupiter low in the east after evening twilight. On the night of November 2nd, the king of planets reaches opposition, meaning it's almost exactly opposite the sun in the sky. Jupiter rises when the sun sets and vice versa. Then, night by night, Jupiter moves a little higher, and by month's end, it'll be well up by the end of evening twilight. Get used to seeing Jupiter's brilliant beacon, because it'll keep sliding westward in the evening sky and remain in view until next April. Now here's a little bonus. Clench your fist and hold it at arm's length. Now look about one fist to the lower left of Jupiter. The planet Uranus is right there. In fact, Uranus also reaches opposition this month on November 13th. That's when it'll be its brightest in the sky. Now, technically, Uranus can be spotted by eye from a super dark sky, but it's very difficult for most of us. Still, if you're up for the challenge, check out the finder chart in Sky and Telescope's November issue. The other bright evening planet is Saturn, and it's already been in view for some time. Saturn isn't nearly as bright as Jupiter, but here's how to find it. Once it gets dark, face south. If you're not sure where south is, watch where the sun sets and make a quarter turn to your left. You'll find Saturn by itself, more or less, above the southern horizon. It'll be roughly a third of the way to overhead if you live at a mid-northern latitude, or as much as halfway up if you're farther south. If you're having trouble finding Saturn, just wait until the nights of November 19th and 20th, when the first quarter moon will be nearby. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Venus continues to put on a real show in the morning sky before sunrise. And if you had to pick one morning to get up early for a look, 
Do that on Thursday, November 9th, when Venus will be joined by a thin crescent moon. And they'll be very close together, separated by less than the tip of your pinky finger. It'll be a stunning sight. With all that activity involving the moon and planets, will there be any stars worth seeing in November? You bet. After it gets dark, and of course that happens sooner now, look high in the southeast for a giant diamond in the sky that's about the size of your outstretched hand with your fingers spread wide apart. Sky watchers the world over know this as the Great Square, representing the chest of Pegasus, the flying horse. Now the square itself is easy enough to see, but you might have trouble visualizing it as part of a horse. For one thing, this horse is flying upside down. Another thing is that the constellation doesn't represent a complete animal, just the front half. The front legs of Pegasus extend from the top star toward upper right. Its neck and head stretch out and up from the diamond's right corner. Now there are a couple of strings of stars stretching leftward from the big square, and those do seem like hind legs to me. But technically they all belong to the constellation of Andromeda, a chained princess in Greek mythology. Throughout the night, Pegasus flies higher in the sky and gets flipped over even more on its back. If your skies are reasonably dark, you should be able to make out the circlet of Pisces, a lovely little pentagon of stars hanging directly under the great square. And you can look past Pegasus' nose to the right by about the width of your clenched fist to reach Delphinus, the dolphin, and my wife's favorite constellation. Like the circlet, it's fairly faint, but if you can see it at all, it's sure to catch your eye. It's a tiny diamond with a tail extending down and to the right. Now go one fist farther to the right, and you'll chance upon another small constellation called Sagitta, the arrow. And its main four stars really look like an arrow, with the brightest of them marking the point. Return to the great square for a moment and focus on the two stars along its right side. Follow an imaginary line downward from them, about four or five fists, until you come to a bright star all on its own above the southern horizon. That's Fomohat, the brightest star in the constellation Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish. In fact, Fomohat derives from the Arabic words meaning mouth of the fish. This solitary sparkler is the only really obvious star in this entire stretch of sky, but don't confuse it with Saturn, which is somewhat higher up. Fomohat is fairly close by as stars go, only 25 light years away, and astronomers have been paying it a lot of attention. It looks like a single point of light, but it's actually a double or binary star. And astronomers have recently realized that it's actually a triple star. Fomohat also is a fairly young star, and it's surrounded by a dusty disk of debris. Oh, and there's a planet going around it, too. Around mid-November at 7 p.m., note what's below Fomohat along your horizon. That direction is due south. Now do an about-face and look due north, and you'll find Polaris, the North Star, roughly halfway from the horizon to overhead. Don't expect to be dazzled by Polaris. It's only half as bright as Fomohat. Take a moment to look straight up some dark night during November. At 10 p.m. early in the month, at 9 halfway through, and 8 at the end. If your sky is truly dark and there's no bright moon around, you just might make out a faint fuzzy glow. That's the Andromeda Galaxy, two and a half million light years away. It's the most distant object you can see with just your eyes. This galaxy is a near twin of our own Milky Way, and it's actually headed our way at about 70 miles per second. Yep, these two behemoths are destined to collide, but not for another four and a half billion years. Our solar system will still be around then, but you and I surely will not. That's about it for this month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org, which offers great star and planet gazing activities. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this sky tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And please leave a rating or a review for this episode. It'll help others to find this podcast. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, 
please do check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and it's produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, we'll explore how a bunch of maidens got involved with an angry bull. Until then, I wish you clear skies. <laughs>